Good afternoon. I'm Eric Schickler, co-director of the Institute of Governmental Studies here at UC Berkeley, and I'd like to welcome you to IGS's kickoff panel for the 2021-2022 academic year, California Votes, the effort to recall Governor Gavin Newsom. With the re recall election nearing the finish line, we've brought together today an excellent set of panelists to really tell us what it all means. Uh, among other topics, we'll analyze the results of our latest IGS poll, which shows Governor Newsom opening up a substantial lead among likely voters. Our chair for the panel is Katie Merrill. Katie is one of California's most successful campaign managers and statewide consultants. She's a partner in the nationally recognized consulting direct mail and media firm Baum and & Merrill, and, which is based in San Francisco. Over the course of her career, Katie has advised and run over a dozen statewide initiative and candidate campaigns in California. Most recently, she helped Eleni Kunalakis and HHS Secretary Javier Becerra become the first elected woman lieutenant governor, governor and Latino attorney general, respectively, in California history, and helped Comptroller Betty Yee win re-election by a record-smashing 8 million votes. Katie served also as chief strategist for California's Prop 35, the anti-human trafficking initiative, which garnered over 81% of the vote. She spent much of her career working to elect women to all levels of office, including city council, mayor, assembly and Senate, US Senate and president of the United States. Katie is frequently sought after by the media for comment on politics and elections. She's a valued member of the IGS community and is a graduate of Amherst College and lives near Berkeley, California. Thank you, Katie, for chairing our panel today. I'll turn it to you, over to you now. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thrilled to be here and thrilled to be here with this uh, wonderful panel. And I wanna go ahead and, and introduce the panel and then we can go to Mark's presentation and, and get right into this exciting discussion about the recall, which is four days away. Um, uh, so first, I want to introduce Mark D. Camillo, who's director of the Berkeley IGS poll, which is a nonpartisan survey of California public opinion on matters of politics, public policy and public affairs conducted by the Institute of Governmental Studies, IGS at UC Berkeley. Uh, Mark has been actively involved in measuring public opinion in California since 1978, when he joined Field Research Corporation, founded by, of course, the legendary pollster Mervyn Field. He worked under Mr. Field as assistant director of the statewide field poll for 15 years and in 1993 succeeded Field to become its director and served in that capacity through 2016. Mark is a recognized authority on polling in California and is the author of hundreds of reports summarizing California public opinion. Since joining IGS, Mark has worked to expand the operations of the IGS poll, which was founded in 2011. He is a cum laude graduate of Harvard University and holds a master's in business administration from Cornell's uh, Johnson School of Business. Welcome, Mark. Uh, Dr. Manuel Pastor is a distinguished professor of sociology and American studies and ethnicity at the University of Southern California. He currently directs the Equity Research Institute at USC. Pastor holds an economics PhD from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and is the inaugural holder of the Turpangian Chair in civil society and social change at USC. Pastor's research has generally focused on issues of the economic, environmental, and social conditions facing low income, low income urban communities and the social movement seeking to change those realities. His latest book, State of Resistance, What California's Dizzying Descent and Remarkable Resurgence Means for America's Future came out in 2018 and was lauded in a New York Times review as quote, concise, clear and convincing, end quote. 2021, we'll see the publication of two new books, South Central Dreams, Finding Home and Building Community in South LA, and Solidarity Economics, Why Mutuality and Movements Matter. And finally, uh, Seema Mehta is a political writer for the Los Angeles Times who covered the 2020 presidential campaign. She was a Knight Wallace Fellow at the University of Michigan for the 2018-2019 academic year studying automation and AI and their impacts on voters in the Midwest. Seema previously covered the 2016, 2012, and 2008 presidential campaigns, as well as multiple gubernatorial, Senate, and mayoral races, a graduate of Syracuse University. The East Coast native swore when she joined the Times in 1998 that she would only spend a few years on the left coast, many years 
a husband and a house and a few cats later, Seema can't imagine living somewhere she couldn't golf year round. So with that, uh, please enjoy this discussion with our panelists and we'll kick it off with Mark's uh, presentation on the latest poll. Mark. Thank you very much. I hope everybody has had a chance to just review the latest results that we released today. There's quite a bit of detail uh, in our IGS poll press release. So I would encourage those who find what I'm saying interesting to at least uh, read through that. Uh, you'll get a much clearer picture, I think, of what we found in this poll. But uh, here in my introductory remarks, I'd just like to uh, review what I consider to be the most salient uh, things about the poll. And I have some PowerPoints that I hope I can bring up on the screen. There we go, the first slide. Okay, a little about the background of the poll. Uh, the poll itself was conducted among almost 10,000 registered voters of whom about a weighted sample of 6,550 were considered likely to vote in this election. Uh, the interviewing dates were August 30th through September 6th, so right through Labor Day. Uh, the survey method was online. We do our surveys by distributing email invitations in English and Spanish to a stratified random sample of the state's registered voters drawn from the voter rolls. Uh, the overall sample was weighted uh, to align it to the demographic and regional characteristics of the state's registered voter population. And I have to say the weighting is quite extensive. Uh, modeling is of a key part of making this survey accurate. Uh, likely voters were identified through voter testimony uh, about their likelihood of voting in the recall election uh, and their interest in voting in the election as well and factoring in uh, their past history of voting in elections. We have their voter record, so we actually know their history of voting. Also, in this particular survey, voters who reported having already voted were included into the sample's likely voter sample if their ballot could be verified as having been received by their local county registrar as of uh, September 7th, that was Tuesday. Uh, and so those voters were added in. But other than that one addition, the likely voter definitions that were used uh, in doing this survey were identical between late July and uh, our early September poll. Well, here you can see the dramatic difference uh, that we found in the two polls. Uh, in late July, among likely voters, 47% said they were inclined to vote yes, 50% uh, were inclined to vote no, 3% were undecided. Yet when we interviewed uh, our new fresh random sample in early September, 38.5% uh, of likely voters were inclined to vote yes, 60%, 60 percent, 60.1 were uh, voting no, and 1% were undecided. So a, a fairly dramatic change as you can see. The biggest change in my judgment of why those uh, figures are there is that we're really looking at two slightly different uh, registered voter populations, or likely voter populations. Uh, in late July, only 58% of registered Democrats uh, said they had a high degree of interest in voting in this upcoming election. Uh, however, as we polled in early September, that increased to 80%. Republicans were always highly interested in voting. It was 87% in late July and 91% in our current poll. But the change in the gap, in the partisan gap in interest really affected the way likely voters are defined in the late July poll compared to the early September poll. Many more Democrats were included as likely voters uh, in the early September poll. This slide shows the fairly dramatic differences. It's one of the more interesting slides because it, it shows that the, uh, in the voting method that voters are using in this election is really going a long way for describing uh, how, how they're going to be voting. Among those who said they would be voting by mail, which accounted for about half of all the likely voters in our sample, 69% said they were intending to vote no, while just 30% were voting yes. Uh, those intending to drop off their ballot 
at an official voting location or drop box were also heavily on the no side, 64% to 35%. By contrast, those intending to vote in person, whether prior to election day or on election day, are just as one-sided, but on the yes side. Our poll shows that those who intend to vote in person on election day will be casting their votes heavily on the yes side. Our poll is estimating it to be 77% to 20%. Now this slide basically shows you the constituencies within the early September a likely voter sample that are intending to vote no, the largest constituencies of no voters. And as you can see, uh, they clustered, uh, and these are pretty much the same three groups at the top, liberals, Biden voters, and Democrats. Over 90% of each of those segments of the voting population um, are saying that they're gonna be voting no on the recall. But as you look at some of the other segments, uh, San Francisco Bay Area voters, which is by far the most democratic constituency in the state, also very likely to be voting no. African Americans, 73%. Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, 70%. Uh, LA County, which is with this, which along with the Bay Area really represents the backbone of the state's Democratic Party, 68% inclined to vote no. Latinos, there's some discussion early in the campaign that Latinos might be wavering in their uh, in their support of, of Newsom and no on the recall, but this poll finds them very much on the no side, 67%, along with women at 64 and no party preference voters uh, coming in at 64% as well. A unique feature of the recall election is that while voters are, uh, that voters are being asked uh, to cast votes on two different questions on the ballot, the yes, no vote on the recall itself, but then also who they would choose to replace the governor should he be recalled. Um, in this poll, 31% of the likely voters say they'll be leaving the second ballot question blank. It's a very interesting phenomenon, very unusual. I've never seen anything really like this before in a poll. And most of those voters are Democrats. 48% uh, of, the, of the likely Democrats say they'll be leaving the replacement ballot blank. Uh, virtually all Republicans will be casting a vote in the replacement ballot, uh, and 70% of those who are no party preference or other voters will be casting a vote. So what this leads to is, you know, the composition of those voting in the replacement ballot portion of the ballot ends up being quite different than the composition of all likely voters voting on the yes, no recall. Uh, and uh, in, in fact, if you look at our poll, there are actually more Republicans uh, that are, are gonna be voting in the replacement election than there are Democrats, which obviously has a big effect on, on preferences in that part of the uh, ballot. And here are the preferences as we've measured them, both in late July and in early uh, September on the replacement portion of the ballot. And as you can see, um, it's uh, very much looking like Larry Elder will be the top uh, candidate in the replacement ballot. Now, one thing about our poll, we do have the advantage because it's an online poll, gives us the opportunity to present voters with the complete list of all 46 candidates running in the replacement ballot, along with their party affiliation and, the, just, and their job description as it appears on the ballot. Uh, so this is, you know, in contrast to polls uh, by telephone, uh, for many, many years I've done polls by telephone, uh, but you don't have that luxury to list so many people uh, and ask how they're going to vote. In our online uh, vote panel, or it's, it's not a panel, online survey, you uh, actually can uh, have that luxury. It shows that uh, uh, in addition to Elder, uh, there's been changes among the challengers. Uh, in fact, Democrat, Kevin Pafrath is actually now polling in second place by a narrow margin. He's receiving 10% of the vote. Uh, most of that is coming from Democrats, as you might imagine, who are actually voting in the, in the replacement ballot. And, uh, but his but elders Republican rivals actually have gone down over the course of this uh, six week period. And, and they've gone down despite the fact that undecided voters uh, have, uh, moved from 40% in late July to just 16%. Uh, 
So they really didn't pick up any uh, additional share of the vote uh, between late July and early September. None of the three Republicans. We do find a scattering of, of uh, preferences and actually increased scattering uh, in the early September poll, voting for other candidates other than these five. These are 41 other candidates. Plus, we also had the opportunity of listing, uh, you know, if you wanted to vote by a write-in ballot. And actually, I think three or four percent of our voters said they would be voting a write-in candidate in the in the replacement election. That's included in the 20 percent. So it's an interesting topology uh, and one that certainly uh, favors Larry Elder as we go to the election. This slide uh, summarizes the subgroups uh, in which Larry Elder is doing the best. Uh, and you can clearly see that the uh, strongest or the highest levels of voter support for Elder come from strong conservatives and from uh, Trump voters and Republicans. Uh, those three groups, uh, about seven in 10 uh, of the likely voters voting in the replacement ballot uh, say they're gonna be voting for Larry Elder. Uh, the next highest proportions come in with the somewhat conservative, so it's really the conservative end of the spectrum uh, that's voting for Elder. Uh, also on a regional basis, he does quite well in four areas. The San Joaquin Valley, that's the southern part of the Central Valley, uh, the Inland Empire to the east of Los Angeles County and Orange County, as well as the North Coast Sierra regions, which is a very sparsely populated uh, area of California. Okay, one of the, uh, our poll was able to present voters with 10 different statements about the recall election itself. And we asked them whether they agreed or disagreed with each statement. Now, these statements included both pro and con statements uh, about the election. Um, and what I'm presenting here, because I think it's uh, the most relevant are the statements that received the highest proportion of agreement among likely voters. And the, the results of the first one, uh, the first statement are, to me are actually the most telling. Um, you have 65% of voters in the, uh, of likely voters voting in this election saying that if a conservative Republican were to become governor as a result of the recall election, it would threaten many of the state's well-established policies on issues like climate change, immigration, healthcare and abortion. This is the real dominant uh, view. And I think it's one of the uh, reasons why Democrats are now much more inclined to be participating in the recall election than said this back in uh, late July, when it really was more an evaluation of, uh, of Governor Newsom's uh, governorship. Other statements that came in with a large majority of voters saying they agreed the cost of holding the recall election is a waste of taxpayer money. And then one that was a, 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 a pro statement in favor of the recall through his own actions, Newsom has demonstrated that the strict policies and behaviors that he wants others to follow during the pandemic don't apply to him. All voters basically agreed with that five to three. And then finally, the recall election is undemocratic because with so many, vote, many people running, if Newsom is recalled a new governor could be elected with only a small share of the vote. That uh, was also uh, uh, agreed to by a majority. So with that, I, I do want to uh, turn it over to the panelists, but if you do want to, uh, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, their press release along with the detailed tabulations from this survey are posted on the IGS website uh, that's shown right here on your screen. Thank you, Mark. Um, Fascinating work as always. And so to kick this off, I wanna ask all the panelists and Seema, I'd like to start with you and then maybe Manuel, you could take over from there and, and we'll, we'll finish with Mark. But um, each of you has been watching the recall closely from your own unique perspective. So what do you think the chief drivers, the chief dynamics are, are at play here since July to drive these numbers uh, and the significant change in the numbers. Seema? 
Um, I think there are two main factors. Number one is Governor Newsom's allies spent $36 million um, over the course of 28 days in August um, you know, to urge their voters to go to the polls to get interested in this election. Um, and then once you know, voters started receiving ballots also in mid-August. So this was like the final, it was a turnout push. It wasn't necessarily a persuasion push, but it was just really to get people to vote. Um, and the other thing is that is Larry Elder entered the race in mid-July and that instantly changed the race. It upended the race. And I think you know, before Newsom and Democrats were arguing that this is a Republican power grab and all this, but it was sort of amorphous. Larry Elder gave them a person, you know, a, a live person to actually aim their commentary at. And it didn't, uh, I mean, it, it didn't hurt, hurt them that Elder had a decades long career on radio making, you know, some statements that you might make as a talk radio host, but you probably wouldn't want to make as a politician. So there was a lot of, of you know, issues, uh, very controversial comments about women, about minorities, about um, all kinds of things um, that uh, that they were able to you know, really use to say, to really create a contrast to say, if this recall is successful, this guy's going to be the next governor. Yep. Manuel? I mean, I would agree with that. I think uh, Gavin Newsom was blessed in his enemies. Uh, Larry Elder personified uh, a conservative, anti-immigrant uh, Republican, and also, I think, sort of crystallized the way in which uh, the right is treating politics as a joke, as a spectacle, rather than a serious question about public policy. So I think Larry Elder was really important at creating what the alternative to Newsom would be. I think the second thing is that as much as the $38 million was important, the ground game finally picked up. And particularly for Black and Latino voters, they're more high touch than high tech. And the fact that there's been a ground game that's actually stepped up, stepped up over the last few weeks and that it's involved a lot of grassroots groups that are traditionally mobilized around propositions versus candidates, I think that's had a significant impact on what Exima identified, which is not persuading someone that they should retain Gavin Newsom, but that they should take the energy to go ahead and cast their ballot. Mark? Right, I would concur. Uh, Larry Elder certainly was the embodiment, I think, of the conservative Republican as we were reading that statement about uh, potentially threatening the state's well-established policies on issues of climate change, immigration, healthcare, and abortion. Those were the four examples that we gave. And I think those voting issues are really important to voters. And uh, I don't think voters really wanted to upset the apple cart with uh, where California is headed on those issues. So I think that really did motivate the Democrats uh, to start to think more about the recall. It's not just about who you like as a personality in the, in the governor's mansion. It's really about the direction of California public policy. And I think that was the overriding concern in the late, uh, in the late going. Well, there's yeah. someone who, go ahead, One please, Manuel, thing, go ahead. Quickly, yeah. Which is, I think also that the pro-recall or Republican side sort of misestimated uh, how the idea of lifting COVID restrictions would motivate Black and Latino voters. They were thinking that it would be all about work. But if you look at, for example, when schools opened up, the group that was the most reluctant to send their kids back to schools were Black and Latino parents because those communities were ravaged by COVID. And so I think that that message that Larry Elder and the other Republican uh, candidates thought would really resonate with communities of color, it really doesn't resonate at all because people are really scared of the disease. They may be scared of the vaccine, there's vaccine hesitancy, but they're really scared of the disease. Right, and the poll actually does include a statement, and it was actually the statement that got the highest degree of disagreement, and it had to do with the COVID pandemic, and it read as follows, Newsom should be recalled because he has greatly overstepped his authority as governor in responding to the pandemic. Um, voters disagreed with that overwhelmingly, 60% to 36, even though yes, voters were 90% in agreement. Uh, it was a, the COVID uh, issue was a big issue for the governor and it certainly benefited him. Well, and let's, I mean, if I could just add one thing, I mean, that's something we've seen that's cracked, even when the um, recall was looking close um, late July in, in, the, in this poll as well as others. One of the things that's always been consistent is that Democrats did approve of, 
um, of Newsom's handling of the pandemic. And, you know, like roughly about six out of 10 voters throughout this whole thing have approved of his handling of the pandemic. That was never the problem. The problem was convincing these people to go to the polls. They, there was not the enthusiasm. So um, it's it's been one of the things that's been, even when there was a lack of enthusiasm among Democrats to vote, there was that consistent approval of his handling of the pandemic. Although I thought the one thing that you pointed out, Mark, earlier um, with the uh, Newsom, uh, um, putting out mandates that he doesn't necessarily follow. I thought the numbers in that were really interesting because um, a decent number of people who oppose the, the recall believe that, you know, that he was being a little hypocritical. And that's, I think that shows, you know, one of the reasons why he got in a little bit of trouble in the first place. Well, let's talk about COVID for a second, because back in April, the yes side was saying you know, if there's a COVID surge, if there are wildfires, the governor's going to be even in more trouble. And in fact, a lot of pundits were sort of concerned about that. Uh, there has been obviously a surge of the Delta variant uh, due to the Delta variant. Um, but in fact, the governor sort of turned that argument on its head and in an ad, in ads and, and on the trail has been saying, we're in a surge we're doing pretty okay compared to other parts of the country because we vaccinated. But if Larry Elder is elected, um, uh, it will all of that will go away and and things will turn bad here. Uh, and so it's the combination of sort of turning COVID on its head and using Larry Elder as a foil. So just talk about that strategy a little bit because it's counterintuitive to certainly to what the yes side thought and and perhaps a misstep in their strategy. Um, I mean, it's just that California is different than Texas or Florida in terms of their voters and what they want. Um, and especially, you know, it's it, the messaging has been so interesting from the Newsom side because it hasn't really been about them. It's been about if one of these Republicans is elected, um, they will get on day one, they will get rid of masks, mask and vaccine uh, mandates. And then Newsom is literally going around saying people are going to die if you <laughs> like one of these people. So it is very much about the, the rivals and it is not about his record. I mean, I think the, the ad they put out this week was the first time you actually saw him speaking to the camera. Otherwise, it was these sort of scary red images and um, you know, like sort of frighten, frightening headlines. So it, it's really interesting about how they have used that argument about COVID. And it's the complete opposite of what you see in other states where you see Republican governors you know, basically being like, we are free. You know, we're not going to do any of this. And so it's, it's just, it's, California is an interesting place, as always. Newsom may have been blessed by Gavin Newsom, but he was also blessed by Ron DeSantis, who showed what an alternative approach would really look like. And that also made things very, very scary. The other thing I think which needs to be said, which is about long-term investments, is that New the Newsom administration adopting the health equity metrics, which helped to target uh, testing resources and also vaccine resources into low-income communities of color and to actually hold opening up uh, business in various counties uh, moving up the tiers to actually dealing with equity, that kind of long-term investment, it probably did not resonate with the average working class or middle-class Latino or Black voter, but it did resonate with Black and Latino politicians who were clamoring for that kind of attention and who have really stepped up over the last month or so to move their constituencies and to uh, the direction that's being said here of not necessarily being pro Newsom, because that's a complicated argument, but being scared of the Republican alternative and being motivated enough to cast a ballot. Right, and one, one thing that really separates California from Florida and Texas is just the very high rate of voters who actually are vaccinated. I mean, if you look at our poll, we asked that question in the poll, 85% uh, of likely voters in California say they've had at least one uh, of the vaccine shots. And, uh, you know, we have very few voters who are not even willing. I mean, it's only down to about 10% who say it's not likely at all that I'm going to take a vaccine shot. So uh, it's a very different uh, backdrop in terms of voters' willingness to protect themselves. Uh, and I think that has a, a lot to do with the politics of this issue. Well, and as you have all raised, um, as soon as Larry Elder came onto the scene, uh, some of these dynamics changed. And uh, as you know, as a practitioner in the, the field of running campaigns, we always say if you're an incumbent in a challenger race, 
You don't want the race to be a referendum on you. You want it to be a choice between you and someone else. Then you beat up that someone else and make them not palatable to voters. And then you end the campaign with positive rainbows and unicorns about yourself. And we're seeing that happen now. So, um, uh, so to your point, you know, uh, indeed, Larry Elder, I think, was a uh, was a was a gift to the to the campaign. I want to talk about turnout. Um, because something very unexpected is happening, I think. Um, uh, if you track the ballot returns uh, daily, as many of us do, you'll know that as of today, we're at already a 33% turnout statewide, which is more than the average of special elections uh, historically in California. And Mark, you, of course, mentioned that uh, everybody really has mentioned that the speculation was the larger the turnout, the better for the governor, the smaller the turnout, the better for the recall folks. So um, we're, you know, we've been tracking until maybe the last couple of days, actually general election, November, 2020 presidential election turnout is extraordinary in terms of returning the ballots. So Mark, one, I want to start with you and just ask you, um, what do you anticipate? Um, even if you want to just make a guess, based on the returns so far, uh, do you think we'll get to the 61% that we saw in the 2003 recall, which was really driven by the celebrity of Arnold Schwarzenegger? Where, where, do, you, where do you think we'll land in terms of turnout? Uh, you're asking me to get beyond my survey data. I know, I know. Uh, you know I, I, I think we will get north of 50%. Uh, I generally listen to Paul Mitchell and listen to his estimates, because again, he's tracking these turnouts and he has the history of past California elections. I think he's also saying that, uh, you know, when I look at our poll, I, I'm just astounded, you know, that of the voters who've already voted, and again, it's almost four out of 10 of the likely voters have already voted by the time we did our survey, they're 70, 30 on the no side. I mean, that is a huge early lead. Uh, and, you know, we tried to get that measurement as precise as possible by first, you know, making sure that the voters in our survey actually had, uh, you know, returned their ballot. But we also used Paul's data to make sure that we had the right demographic characteristics of the early voters, the right age characteristics of the early voters. And we did this not only statewide, but across the eight regions of the state that we examined. We had very detailed weighting information about those early voters. So in some respects, our early voter sample is as much as, as close as I can get to a, an exit poll. Uh, it, it, it shapes the vote the way it actually is. Uh, we asked the preference measure in our poll uh, and we've got a very large sample of these early voters. I think uh, it's very clear to me that Newsom is off to a very big early lead. And, and Seema and Manuel, what do you think's driving uh, this this large turnout? I mean, you've spoken a little bit to the money that's been spent in the ground game, but but tell us a little more. I mean, do you think the fact that everybody's, for instance, received uh, a ballot makes a difference? And if you feel like speculating on what you think the final turnout number would be, uh, I'd love to hear that too. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I, mean, I think there's two factors. Um, in terms of the turnout. One, you mentioned everyone, this is such a strange election because everyone, it's taking place during an off year, it's during a September, it's special, um, but everyone did receive a ballot. And so it's a lot easier, you know, you don't have to really think about it. You don't have to figure out where your polling place is, you know, you don't have to get by the stamp, just send it in. So I think that that's one thing. But the other thing that I think is a big factor in explaining why the early vote is so anti-recall pro Newsom is because of the way that voting patterns in, the, in this nation have changed in the last couple of years. Um, up until very recently, Republicans voted early and Democrats voted on election day. And that was totally upended by former President Trump, who really questioned the integrity of mail balloting. So now you have Republicans, you know, who are very hesitant to mail in their ballots because they think they're, they're going to be messed with or they're not going to arrive in the proper place. And so you have Democrats voting early and then Republicans waiting, either holding on until the voting centers open so they can cast their ballot or drop it off in person or waiting until election day to cast their ballot. So, I mean, we and this is the polling I think bears this out. You know, on election day, you're going to see a lot more Republicans at the polls than Democrats, or at least a lot more anti-recall folks at the polls. I mean, I think that the Newsom side has done a very good job in the last couple of weeks of making clear what the consequences of the election might be. And that's served to motivate people. And then there's been very good outreach about how easy it actually is to vote. 
Uh, there's a lot of people, Seema, who are actually also sort of trying to figure out where they put that mail-in ballot because when they got it, they filed it with a bunch of bills. They weren't paying attention. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, this consequence of the election have become kind of clear. I'm not going to make a mistake and predict what the level of turnout will be. But I suspect it's going to be surprising to all of us who at the beginning were deeply concerned that uh, an election that was in a non-presidential year, not even in a regular non-presidential year, but sort of off-off cycle that had, uh, you know, an odd format with, uh, you know, a question yes or no, and then 40 odd candidates, several of them actually pretty odd on the uh, second question. Uh, you know, we thought that this was going to be something that people would be really disengaged from. But the political, it's always been a, a race about whether or not the political education would catch up with the political consequences. And it seems like they figured out how to do that. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's interesting, if you speaking of Paul Mitchell and, and political data, the firm that that is releasing this this daily ballot tracker, um, they break it down by ethnic group. And it shows that 38 percent of whites have voted so far. Uh, 33 percent of API have voted so far. Uh, 31 percent of African-Americans have voted so far and 21 percent of Latinos have voted so far. So it, it brings me to two questions. One is, one, why do we think the Latino vote is um, lagging uh, here? And two, uh, I, I did notice, Mark, in your data that it was something like 30%, I think, of Latinos were, uh, uh, I guess maybe, I think it's fair to say yes on recall, because I think it was 67% or something were, um, or no on the recall. And Clint, since November of 2020, there's been a lot of hand wringing among Democrats about the Latino vote. A third of the Latino vote went to President Trump. The two Latino districts in Florida flipped from Democrat to Republican. Are Democrats taking Latinos for granted? Is their messaging wrong to, to Latinos? Uh, so in the context of that, um, what do you make of Mark's data that, you know, a third or so are, are not no, um, and that we have this lagging um, early vote return from Latino voters. Um, and Manuel, I wondered if you wanted to take a shot at that. Well, first, uh, a low Latino turnout is not really a surprise. Uh, although Latinos are 28% of the registered voters, typically they're a much smaller share of the actual voters. Some of that has to do with uh, age, it's a younger electorate. Often uh, young people are a little bit less engaged in the issues. And it's simply uh, the sort of traditional sleeping giant never fully achieving its potential. I'm also not particularly surprised that you're seeing uh, less support for retaining the governor than with uh, black voters, uh, for example. Um, you know, for educated uh Latinos, and this I mean not just a high level of education, but engaged in election. Uh, understanding that Newsom was part of extending health insurance to undocumented Californians above the age of 50, below the age of 18, that he helped bring uh, relief uh, to these communities uh, during the pandemic, that he appointed Alex Padilla as the first Latino senator in the history of California, all of that's well known if you're politically engaged already. But if you're not politically engaged already, the last 18 months have been your family being hard hit by COVID, you experiencing a tremendous amount of job loss or wage fluctuations as a result of COVID, and your kids being stuck at home and not being able to go to school because the schools weren't open. Your life's been hard. And there's a guy you can blame it on, the governor. So it takes, a, as I was saying before, political education to say that really isn't the governor's fault. That's the result of COVID. Here's what the governor's done and engage those voters to move forward. So I'm not surprised at all by these results. One thing I do think Democrats need to worry about is what happened in the presidential election where Trump made inroads 
with Latinos, particularly Latino men, and not just in South Florida and not just in the Texas borderlands, but it looks like in other places as well. And that's a long-term problem for Democrats who have taken the Latino vote for granted. Seema, any thoughts? Just uh, the one thing I would add was that, um, as you mentioned earlier, this is an off-off year. This is September. People are used to voting now. Um, Latinos and young voters as well, who are also underperforming, these are two groups that are notoriously hard to turn out during non-presidential years. And this isn't just a non-presidential year. This is even weirder. So, <laughs> yes, Mark, anything from the data you want to share, including anything I misrepresented? <laughs> oh, um, our final poll showed that Latinos would actually constitute, you know, a much smaller share of the vote than they constitute in the overall electorate. It's about 27 percent among registered voters. Uh, in our poll, I think we had Latino participation at maybe 20 percent share of the vote. Uh, I think that seems about right to me. Uh, in terms of a, what I would consider kind of a quote unquote normal election. And the shape of this turnout appears to me to be a very typical kind of California turnout, whereas the turnout in our late July poll was so atypical. And that's why the alarm bells really uh, rang. And, and I, I'm sure the governor's polling was showing the same thing. Certainly other polls, I saw CBS showing the same thing. I mean, voters just, the Democrats were just not paying attention and didn't know the stakes of the uh, of the outcome. So I, I think that changed dramatically in just six weeks. And the other thing I'd say about the recall campaign this year, it's a compressed time frame. Usually we have three or four different measures on uh, pre-election polls among likely voters. We can only squeeze in two. Uh, I mean, and that's within a six week period. So a lot has happened in a very compressed time frame. And those early polls, I mean, we were talking about gifts to Newsom, those polls that showed it close, I think those were in a way a gift to him too, because it really, it you know, Democrats I think might have thought, yeah, that he has it in the bag. This is such a democratic state; it's fine. Um, and I think those polls showed at one point this was it looked really, really close. Katie, I think one thing to lift up in this conversation too is what's going to happen the day after the election, because what you're going to see is people reading the tea leaves of all the numbers that Mark was bringing forth and trying to argue that it was this constituency that actually made the difference. And as a result, the governor owes this constituency, this set of policy measures. So uh, Mark's numbers are going to be incredibly important, not just in the run up to voting, but in the interpretation afterwards about whether it was black voters, whether it was labor voters, whether it was teachers, what part of California, whether it was Latino voters, did they outperform a little bit more? And was that because of some of the motivation in the last couple of weeks? And how uh, policy gets made after this election, who can insist that favors are owed them? Uh, the politics doesn't stop with the votes being cast. Well, and I'm not just with the polls, but I think if you look at the, I don't even know what they're up to. Last time I looked at the pro, uh, the pro Newsom forces were up to what, seventy-some million dollars, and so I think that'll be another interesting place to look at in terms of uh, what happens to policy. And it is the end of the legislative session, and there are a lot of bills going to the governor's desk. Um, to to Manuel's point, so um, let's talk about the second question on the ballot. Uh, you know, Mark, your numbers are fascinating. Thirty-one percent saying. Uh, they're not going to even vote for anybody on, on the second question. I think you said it was 48% of, of Democrats. That has been um, the message from the uh, governor's campaign from the beginning. Number one, keep any um, qualified, reasonable, well-known, uh, elected, slash, 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 between all those words, um, Democrat off the, off the ballot, which they successfully did and now saying to voters, just vote no, answer the first question, put your ballot in the mail. Um, so, so what do we? What do you all think of that? Do you think the strategy was successful in terms of keeping uh, a, a qualified Democrat off the ballot? And um, and and what do you make of you know thirty one percent of folks saying, uh, I don't know who to, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to cast a ballot on the second question. Let me just talk about the 31% and you guys can weigh in on the reasons and so on. But um, 
the 31 percent to me is astounding uh, and 48 percent of democrats I, I would have never in my wildest dreams expected that kind of uh, allegiance or obedience to what the governor's campaign was trying to get voters to do because basically you're telling voters we don't want you to vote on that ballot. I mean, to me, that under, undercuts the democratic process. And I, I, I'm a follower of elections. I always thought that voters like to weigh in on these decisions. So it's a remarkable finding. Uh, and you know, we actually had a question uh, embedded in our poll uh, asking voters who chose not to vote. In fact, we only asked it to people who had already voted. So the subsample of people who were already voted and left that ballot blank, we asked them the reasons for doing so. And there were two reasons far and away mentioned more than others. Uh, I didn't feel comfortable supporting any of the candidates. 43% chose that as a response. I felt it would be detrimental to Newsom if I voted for someone else to replace him. 41%. Those were the key reasons that played back. It wasn't because, well, there are 46 candidates on the ballot I had a hard time making. You know, there were other reasons that they could have chosen. Uh, but it, to me, it's just a remarkable uh, circumstance that we're going to have these. Uh, and we'll see it in the statement of votes. If the total number of votes cast in the recall will far exceed the total number of casts uh, uh, cast in the replacement election. Right. So the that, um, yeah, they did have the. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, they are the the Newsom campaign and Democrats have been very consistent on this thing. Leave the second question blank. One, I think, um, there's a lot of confusion among voters. Like, I mean, I've gotten so many emails and social media tweets from people who are convinced if they vote no on the first question and they put in a, a name on the second question that it, nu it nullifies their vote. I mean, so there's a lot of confusion about this process. And so I think one, it was to sort of just have a simple, easy to understand, deliver message to deliver to voters. Number two, it's strategically. If he, so, say if he survives the recall, um, and the, you know, here's the list of potential people who will run against him next year. And if the lower the number of votes that these people get, the more he can, you know, sort of crow about that to be like, you know, I beat this person by however many million votes. Um, so I think it helps to diminish his rivals. And then also, but I do think that you know, from a good government perspective, there were questions about is this the right policy? Because whether or not, even if you oppose the recall. If it is successful, one of these people will be the next governor, and there is a lot of policy differences between these people. So in terms of you know, it was certainly good for Newsom's strategy, but the question is, is this the right policy for the state if you care about, you know, how the state is governed? So another way in which uh, I think Newsom was uh, blessed, and in this case by Arnold Schwarzenegger, and I'll say why. I think that this election was portrayed by Newsom and arguably was anti-democratic in a small t sense. So Mark, you talk about this kind of how could people in a you know, democracy uh, wind up voting on the alternative. The perception was that this was a power grab, that this was a circumstance in which a Republican who could never win a statewide election uh, party uh, had manipulated the process in a way that would give them a chance at winning the election with a minority vote. And I think the experience of 2003, in which Arnold Schwarzenegger, who you know was a celebrity, but actually was a fairly reasonable candidate, and governed governed as a you know initially a sort of conservative, but then more moderate Republican, kind of really lifted up the specter that someone could actually win uh, here. That would because when if a Schwarzenegger type was on the ballot then I think that made it a lot easier to reject Davis. So I think the way the history played out and then the consistent messaging on the part of the Newsom campaign that this was an anti-democratic ploy for Republicans to seize power. And then as a result, that one needed to respond in a way that sort of conflicted with traditional democratic strategies of, you know, got to vote in the second election, but instead did a power play right back by keeping Democrats off the replacement list and by uh, not voting there. I think it really played in terms of this was a strategic play by Republicans. Therefore, Democrats need to make a strategic play right back. The degree of party loyalty is quite surprising. One thing that, you know, if you think about it, by all of these Democratic voters not choosing to vote in the replacement election, you're really inflating 
uh, the percentage of the vote that Larry Elder is going to get. So he's going to come out of this election appearing to get a very large chunk of the voting public. Uh, but actually, it's the voting public who choose to vote in this election. The actual numbers won't match the governor's, but his percentage of the vote will be quite high, I believe, uh, which, you know, in a backhanded way, tended to benefit Larry Elder by messaging uh, Democrats not to participate. And in a super backhanded way, a candidate will benefit Gavin Newsom because the Republican uh, voters will say, God, Larry Elder's our guy. Look how many votes he got. Let's run him as a gubernatorial candidate against Gavin Newsom. Again, Gavin Newsom made a tremendous political mistake by going to the French laundry. That created an image problem uh, that's just lasted and lasted and lasted. The number of gifts he's gotten in this election, he's a lucky guy. Well, that's a, a, a good place for us to move to um, audience questions uh, with the few minutes we have left. And so just to stay uh, on this question two issue for a second, one of the audience questions is how will the roll off the gap between questions, question one and question two be interpreted post-election? Will it embolden claims of fraud? Interesting question. We haven't talked about about voter fraud, uh, which was a, a big deal uh, during the last election. What, what do you think? What do you think of that question? People are already talking. People are already laying out allegations of fraud. I mean, we've seen former House Speaker Newt Gingrich say it to it. We've seen um, a number of people. Uh, there was a I'm sorry, a conservative commentator on Fox News, who's Tammy. I can't pronounce her last name. She was saying this earlier. I think earlier this week or last week. Um, basically, she said the only way that Newsom holds on to office is if there's massive voter fraud. So these. Um, ideas are already being pushed in conservative media. And um, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm certain we're going to see allegations and hear allegations of that. Any other thoughts on that? Well, I think the bigger the victory, uh, the less salient the message of fraud is going to be. Uh, you know, it looks like Newsom is going to be comfortably, uh, you know, voted back into office with the no vote. Um, you know, one thing that I was I guess a little concerned and, and some of the, you know, we partner with the LA Times when we're developing our survey questionnaire and John Myers actually said, why don't you, uh, you know, include that question about how you're going to voting, but also try to measure how many people in this state actually hand off their ballot to somebody else to turn in, which is ballot harvesting. And if you had to think about it, that has the greatest potential for fraud. Uh, so we included that among the choices and only 1% of the, and it was very hard to even try to untangle the numbers that were associated with those people uh, were actually handing off their ballot uh, to somebody else. So that doesn't seem to be very common uh, in, in California, although you see a lot of articles written about it. It's not a very prevalent way of voting. You know, I think another thing that's going to come up the day after the election for the last couple of weeks, Fox News, which I also watch, um, has really been on a jag with the narrative of California going to hell in a handbasket. When there's an overwhelming vote in favor of Gavin Newsom, uh, or at least not recalling the governor, that narrative is going to be harder and harder to sustain. Uh, but it's still going to be deeply believed by Fox News viewers. And it's going to contribute to the increased polarization and segmentation and siloization of media and narrative and news stories, where California is going to feel generally probably pre pretty proud of itself that it retained Newsom and the rest of the, or part, the red parts of our nation are going to worry about fraud and going to worry about how the left coast has just gone crazy. So I want to take a moment to um, uh, speculate about what would happen if there's a different outcome than what the polls are now indicating. Because as we know, Mark, no offense to you and your profession, there have been mistakes. Uh, <laughs> there have been some mistakes in polling. So let's talk for a minute, a uh, few minutes that we have left. You know, what happens if Gavin Newsom loses? So one question we have uh, and that is, what if the recall passes? One question we have from the audience, is it possible that the governor would legally challenge the election if he loses by arguing that more people voted for him on question one by voting no 
than the winner of question two on the ballot. So any any thoughts on sort of possible legal challenges? I mean, Erwin Chemerinsky laid out that strategy in the New York Times and um, it's it would be pretty, I, I don't know. I don't know what the strategy is if he, if he loses, but it would be for something that is legal in California right now in terms of the recall and how it's set up, it would be pretty remarkable to try to overturn um, the, the will of the voters. So um, I, I don't, I, I don't have any insight into, insight into that, but I just think it would be sort of a remarkable argument to make. Um, and also, but I think that there are a couple of things we can talk about. What happens if we have a governor elder on the way? Um, first of all, there'd be about a month long period where Democrats could really try to do everything in their power because of, you know, of, their, of their power in both houses of the legislature to shrink whatever power um, that the governor has. Diane Feinstein could decide to retire. Um, there's so there's just um, and then politically, I mean, it would cause such a shockwave. Like I think across the nation, it would affect the midterms. You would have every you know, Republican governor crowing about this because California is such a symbol. And you know, it's like a, a lot of people like to to crap on California because of various things. I mean, it, it would just be such a remarkable political shift. I just think it would be fascinating to watch. Um, I think it would have implications for the midterms in California because there are a lot of important congressional seats in play. Um, and it would just be a remarkable fail failure of the Democratic Party in a state that is so blue to not be able to keep this. Yeah, it would be quite remarkable if the state of resistance became a state of reaction. And what we would see too, I think if a governor elder got elected is 14 months of trench warfare between the uh, super majorities in the assembly and the state Senate and the governor, but also a real uh, meaning of the word deep state, because there are so many progressives who are in state bureaucracies, moving forward on climate policy, moving forward on more rights for immigrants, moving forward on labor rights, moving forward on public health measures, you would see uh, really a combination of trench warfare and political dysfunction. Uh, quite entertaining for political commentators, quite painful for Californians. So Mark, go ahead. I think you yeah, want to say. My poll aside, uh, you could make a lot of money in Las Vegas or on the betting markets right now by saying that Gavin Newsom is going to be recalled. The odds are just going down and down and down. So, you know, if you really think that the polls are all wrong, go for it. You're going to make some money. <laughs> so in, in our last minute, let's just do a speed round. Um, and it is this. What does Gavin Newsom do uh, if he loses? So what does he do in 2022? Um, uh, does if he loses, does he run again? And if he wins, can anybody even possibly beat him in 2022? Seema, you want to start? Yeah, if he if he wins, I think it depends on does he win by one point or does he win by 20? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, like how much of a mandate does he have? If he wins by 20, you know, it's clear that you know the entire Democratic Party coalition behind him, he has donors, et cetera. Even if he wins by one point, he still has all that power as incumbent, you know, with what he can do with, with labor, with his backers, with donors. So he'd still be in a strong position, but he's in a much stronger position, the higher the margin um, in terms of whether he gets challenged on, on, from the left. And then if he loses, that's, I don't know. I mean, that's like a fascinating thing because there are a lot of hungry Democrats that want to run for office. So if he loses, I think you know, a lot more people would seriously consider running next year. And well, I think he'll win and probably by a reasonable margin. And he will have owed so much to so many different constituencies that the next year will be about making sure that they're all happy, which will cement a very powerful alliance that makes him the only reasonable democratic candidate to go forward. The interesting question will be if he can portray himself, particularly if he gets to be governor again in a regular election as a viable candidate, uh, for the presidency some years from now. Mark, any thoughts, any closing thoughts there? Yeah, actually I, I do have one and it's a teaser uh, that actually our poll included trial heat preference questions about the next gubernatorial election. And we paired Governor Newsom against each of the leading Republicans that are in this recall. And we're gonna be reporting on that after the election. And you can Fantastic. see- Fantastic. Well, I want to thank everyone 
uh, on the panel, Seema Mehta of the LA Times, Manuel Pastor of USC, Mark D. Camillo of Institute of Governmental Studies, the IGS poll. And I wanna thank our sponsors, the Robert T. Matsui Center for Politics and, and Public Service, the Citrin Center for Public Opinion Research and the California Constitution Center of Berkeley Law. Thank you everyone for attending, fantastic discussion. Uh, and thank you to IGS. Thank you. Thanks.